So, hi everyone, welcome to Outgrow's Marketer of the Month. I'm your host, Saksham Sharda. I'm the Creative Director at Outgrow. And for this month, we are going to interview Nat Eliasson, who is the founder and CEO of growthmachine.com. Uh, so Nat, we are going to start with a very uh, with a rapid fire round just to break the ice. Uh, try to keep right. your answers to one word or one sentence only. Uh, <laughs> okay. What's your middle name? Kaiser. Kaiser. <laughs> like Caesar Kaiser. Okay. Uh, yep, how exactly. long does it take you <laughs> to get <laughs> how long does it take you to get ready in the mornings? I guess it depends on what you mean by ready. Oh, I have to be quick. Uh, five minutes. <laughs> oh, five minutes. That's not fair. That's probably, that's not true. Okay. How long does it take you to get ready for uh, morning at work when you're actually going somewhere for work? Well, I work from home, so five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. Okay. Uh, pick one. Neil Patel or Gary Vaynerchuk? Oh, uh, can I pick neither? <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> uh, well, I guess probably going to create one. controversy. <laughs> Did you pick one yet? Oh, yeah. I said, I'll, I guess I'll pick Patel then. Okay, Neil Patel. Uh, how many cups of coffee do you drink per day? One to two. I'm more of a tea guy. Okay. Yeah, well, okay. I can see why. <laughs> Cup and leaf might be the answer. <laughs> okay. Which country will be the superpower of the 21st century? China? China, okay. How many hours of sleep can you survive on? Survive? Mm-hmm. Four and a half. Okay. Uh, one thing that your wife or partner finds the most annoying about you? If it's not in my Asana or to-do list, she has to ask me to do it like 10 times. <laughs> okay. Uh Andrew Yang or Bernie Sanders? Oh, Yang, all the way. Oh my God, everyone just picks Yang. <laughs> Every <time laughs> <counted. laughs> Okay, what does a person need to be happy? Mm. Wanting less. Oh. Anti-capitalism. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, now I'll move on to the bigger questions. The first one is uh, kind of a curveball. It's uh, what's the strategy about Pinterest that most people think is true, but you think is bullshit? Oh, that's interesting. You know, I'm actually I'm not really the Pinterest expert in our company. Uh, our, our chief operating officer, Nora, she guides a lot of the Pinterest stuff that we do. And she wrote a really good article on uh, on Pinterest for, for our blog. And we get like 500 odd visitors a day from it for Cup and Leaf. But I would say that, you know, her or what she might say and what I would probably say too is that the biggest thing with Pinterest that people get wrong is just like not doing it, especially if you're putting any energy into Instagram. Because if you're trying to get traffic, you know, somewhat naturally or organically, uh, Pinterest, the, the longevity of stuff on Pinterest is so much longer than Instagram. You can have posts that continue to bring in traffic for you for months. You have to keep pinning things to stay Mm -hmm. relevant, but pins have great longevity. So if you're putting any energy into Instagram, simply repurposing those visuals for Pinterest, uh, is kind of a no brainer. Yeah. And you can just do that through buffer now, I think. Buffer has a pin. Yeah, and, yeah I'm pretty know, sure like... you can use Buffer. And mm. if you get a good uh, freelancer on Fiverr, then there's usually ones who can take the normal like square things you might do for mm. Instagram and repurpose them into Pinterest graphics. Or if you're doing Instagram stories with ads or whatever, uh, a lot of those story photos can make good uh, Pinterest content. Or if you just you know you're writing blog articles and then you create that vertical what is it uh i think it's six by nine i can't remember exactly the dimensions but you're just creating yeah. those images for pinterest and repinning most of your work along with or pinning most of your work along with repinning a bunch of other stuff from your domain it doesn't take that long to build up a pretty good following i think if you look at the reach on pinterest for something like cup and leaf it, it gets like a million impressions a month which is kind of insane um and it doesn't, again, it doesn't take that much effort to do. 
Do you reckon they chose a different dimension from Instagram just to differentiate from Instagram? Because otherwise it would just become like a Instagram copy. Well, I mean, it existed before Instagram, but I mean, like, because of Instagram's popularity, I just feel people would have just started repost, re, just like taking the Instagram posts and putting them on Pinterest. I don't yeah. Know, think? I, I think, you know, one, the Pinterest photo feed is really, really aesthetically pleasing right like you you can scroll kind of endlessly because there's always another image popping up uh where you you never get to the end of the feed because even if you're at the bottom of one image there's a few more images that you can see like the top half of so there's always something else to make you keep going and so that that photo shape lends itself to that kind of endless scrolling but i think they also just wanted to you know create a nice vertical visual format that lended itself well to fashion uh to like not necessarily to infographics mm -hmm. but to kind of explanatory content because certain types of information work very very well on pinterest and it's in in many ways it's like the opposite of slideshare right where the the business dimensions are horizontal and the visually appealing dimensions are, mm -hmm. are vertical uh and also i think mm -hmm. the phone fit right like pinterest yeah, works perfectly on a phone because it is a vertical device and you know works much more naturally there than on desktop which again is good for like powerpoints that are more horizontal yeah yeah that makes complete sense i'm actually i just started scrolling through my pinterest feed just to like get a visual <laughs> representation of what you're saying and it is addictive because the other day uh, my friend wanted to order a birthday cake for her birthday. And the first thing she was like, yeah, I'm not going to go to Instagram or Google or somewhere. She said, I'm going to go to Pinterest and pick a cake from there. So for certain industries, it does tend to work very well, I think. Yeah, you're completely right there. Let's move on to the next question, which is, what do you think is the reason for the uh, growing popularity of quizzes in the information age? Hmm. I think there are two things here. One, email pop-ups are overdone and boring. And I think that's why you see certain other kinds of tools popping up to replace them. Whereas you know, six years ago, you could do an email pop-up to get a PDF of you know my 10 best marketing tips. And you might get like a 6, 8, 10% conversion rate. And you really don't get those rates anymore unless you're you know, Tim Ferriss or someone. So mm. people have had to find other ways to entice people to give them their email address. Uh, and one on Shopify stores that everyone's probably seen is that like spinning wheel where you've got a mm. chance to win a hundred dollar gift card or whatever. And, you know, in most mm. cases you don't really win anything, but they've already got your email. And so they can follow up with you that way. Uh, you see this in uh, quiz funnels, obviously, right? Because it's it's a big ask to say like, give me your email address and I'll send you a buyer's guide for my product, right? Or for the area of things that you're reading about. That's better than a normal email pop-up, but even better than giving your email address for a buyer's guide is, hey, like take a quiz to find out mm -hmm. the best tea for you. And then at the end of the quiz, say that for someone to get their results, they need to put in their email address. You know, when we did that on our blog, it basically 5 x our email signups, right? Over a standard coupon mm -hmm. email call to action. And so even though it takes you know, 10 times as long for the reader to do and requires following way more steps. It's, it's much more personalized and it gives, uh, it gives them a lot more value than just a PDF. And I think that in order to continue to have high conversion rates to email and to have high conversion rates from content to products, you need some way to middleman the buyer journey because the mm -hmm. challenge with content and with search traffic is that those those readers are coming in very cold and they don't know much about your business or what your or your product and so you need to show them when it makes sense how you know the products that you have actually answer the underlying question that led them to your site in the first place and a quiz or a way to help someone quickly filter down the types of products they might be interested in can help pretty significantly, mm -hmm. especially if you're in a business that has a large number of different SKUs that might be kind mm -hmm. of confusing to choose between. So, yeah, no, I completely agree because, well, it kind of ties in with what you were saying earlier about what does a person need to be happy? And you said, 
uh, having less because I think it's capitalism that provides too many options. And then there's like a decision paralysis, which I think a quiz can easily solve because it can actually help you choose, like you're saying, if there are too many services. So, yeah, that sounds uh, and like an interesting approach as to why the quizzes are more popular and how uh, email pop-ups, etc., cetera, are decreasing and people become suspicious of that. But what would you have to say about then uh, the suspicion against quizzes that has come via uh, the fact that it is a new territory and it is not regulated? So whatever has happened with Cambridge Analytica, for instance, what would you have to say about that? I mean, there's not really any data that's going into a quiz funnel that would be personally identifying or embarrassing, right? I mean, if if Cup and Leaf's Clavio account got hacked and someone got access to everyone's quiz answers, I mean, they would find out that Nat Eliasson <laughs> in Austin, Texas likes tea with caffeine, right? Like, I don't really care if they know that. The issue with a lot of other data privacy stuff is, you know, on, on Facebook scale, somebody who gets into that information can know, can, well, they can figure out where you live, where your family mm. lives, where your kids go to school, like what kind of car you drive, how much money you make, uh, where you went to university. Like they can they can basically completely compromise your identity short of your social security number. <laughs> so <laughs> you're, you're not giving up any information on that scale. I don't think there'd be much to be skeptical of. Yeah, I completely agree. Cause like uh, the data that's being provided is like not, as you're saying, uh, not that relevant for someone to like uh, do any harm to you, but yeah. Okay. Uh, I was going to say the next question is uh, Instagram has also now started incorporating quizzes in their stories uh, so in an Instagram story, a user or an influencer can actually now post a quiz and that works out for them. So do you think uh, softwares or like, you know, products like Instagram and Pinterest are also going to move towards a quiz in the future? They're going to have full functioning quiz functionalities within their uh, interface? Well, I mean, Instagram already does in stories, yeah. right? Because mm -hmm. people can create them and then, you know, can use it to pull their followers. But in terms of using it to sell product, maybe. We, we have seen that both Pinterest and Instagram have moved in the direction of being uh, like shopping, like shopping storefronts, right? Where people can sell products mm -hmm. directly in their photos and in their pins. And so if they allowed users, business or otherwise, to create some sort of funnel within Pinterest and Instagram that might be interesting, but I kind of doubt that would ever become an actual feature on either site just because it's not, it's not really what they're meant to do. The, the buying activity is sort of a secondary feature of the social following. It's not the primary feature of the platform. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, if they were actually allowing influencers and businesses and whatnot to build out quiz funnels, that would be kind of turning the buying function into the, primary you know reason to use the tool and i don't think they're going to move entirely in that direction okay uh so the next question is what's the most important thing you learned from doing marketing for cup and leaf hmm most important thing i think part of it would be what we were just talking about with that paralysis of choice uh mm -hmm. the the big issue in t is a lot of people are interested in it and want to, you know, try to get into tea either to get off coffee or for the health benefits or whatnot. Most people who come to our site and come to our store don't have the tools they need to make loose leaf tea, for example. And that was something we didn't realize. We assumed a lot of people who came would already be interested in tea or would already be familiar with tea. And, you know, one, we discovered that most people had no idea how to actually start brewing loose leaf tea. And two, that nobody had any idea what kind of tea to even get. Because if you're used to just going to uh, Starbucks or wherever and ordering like a black tea or a green tea, and then you get to the site and there's a dozen different black teas and none of them just, mm -hmm. and none of them say like just black tea, then it's sort of hard to know what to buy. And I think that was where doing a quiz funnel is really valuable for us too, was that it helped us cut through some of that confusion for our customers so that they could figure out what actually fit, what they were looking for, instead of just being overwhelmed by the abundance of options. Mm, so it's like a shop assistant who, like if you go to buy some glasses, he's going to be yeah. like, oh, I can help you out. If you're going to buy tea, it's like, oh, tell me your preferences and I can help you. So it's like a virtual shop assistant. <laughs> exactly. So that's a good analogy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, in at Outgrow, in addition to quizzes, because like we also like the software Outgrow provides uh, 
allows people to make quizzes without developers. Uh, we also like have other kinds of interactive content like calculators, tests, polls, e-commerce recommendations, which is really like a shop assistant, and then chatbots, forms, and contests. So what other forms of interactive content would you recommend to your audience in addition to a quiz? Like keeping in mind this whole discussion we've had about the information age uh, and everything, what other kinds of interactive content do you think would uh, provide engagement? I like the quizzes. I like the chat bots, especially the ones that feed into Messenger because that can have mm -hmm. a really high uh, response rate and open rate for when you're following up with people in it. Um, I like the store activity feeds, so kind of like FOMO or Proof for one of those tools where you can see, you know, what other people in the store are buying. I think those are the big ones. I generally dislike the really aggressive email pop-ups, the full screen takeovers, all of those. You know, they, they have their time and place that can be effective, but some of these more, mm. more conversational, more helpful tools like you're talking about, I think just one, they convert better. And two, they create a better experience for the end user than just being aggressive with pop-ups. Mm. Mm. Yeah, okay. So as long as like they're not aggressively harming the user, so it has to be like part of a flow, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah, you don't want okay, to make it so feel like a that... scammy sales site. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, I think that covers uh, everything. And thanks uh, for letting us interview you. And everyone, do check out Nat's website, growthmachine.com. And also do check out Cup and Leaf and their T-Quiz, which is pretty interesting.